All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight, I want to talk to you guys about the Orthodox Theology of Angels. So this is a topic that I've been wanting to cover for a while, but I knew that as soon as I dove in to do some of the research for this topic, I was going to be inundated with so much stuff. And so I've got just little reading sections from this is a great book. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Byzantine Theology by John Mayendorf, uh, Pseudo Dionysius on um, the Celestial Hierarchy. I got uh, uh, things from Father Sarah from Rose. He has a whole chapter on angels and the soul after death. And I even got some stuff over here from St. John of Damascus. Uh, but that is really going to be safe for the part two, because this video is going to be a really, a hopefully, a solid foundational introduction to how the Orthodox Christian Church, the original church, um, understands the role of angels. Anybody who's gone to an Orthodox church, anybody who's familiar with icons, angels are everywhere. Angels are incredibly important in our theology. But... To actually just get the theology and the framework and the understanding of them laid out is a little bit more ambiguous than one might think. Um, and so we see the, them in the icons everywhere. In fact, we all have, uh, orth we, all of us Orthodox have our own holy guardian angel, and we can pray to the angels. We can pray to Archangel Michael. We can pray to our holy guardian angel. But of course, we're not praying to them to do anything for us. This is often a misconception for Protestants. Uh, they hear that we can pray to, for example, our holy guardian angel, and they think, oh my gosh, why wouldn't you just pray to God? Well, we're all praying to God. When we pray to our holy guardian angel, we're asking them to pray to intercede on our behalf, and that is also true for the Theotokos, the mother of God, and whatnot. So today we're going to be looking at who are the angels, and I got a a very good video from Father Spirit and Bailey. Shout out to him and all the fellow apologists over at Patristic Faith. And then uh, I got multiple articles. We've got Ortho, uh, Ortho Wiki pulled up on, because we're also going to look at what are the cherubim and the seraphim. Because obviously when you look at the iconography of angels, they look very human-like. They look like men. They look like sexless uh, hominids. But when I read Ezekiel, I'm seeing uh, wheels within wheels. I'm, I'm talking about cherubim with, with eyes, multi-winged uh, multi uh, creatures. So we're going to look at OrthoWiki. What are the seraphim and the cherubim? And uh, also look at some of the biblical uh, points in which they're mentioned. So again... Today's video is really the part one. Part two is going to be over at the website. So make sure you become a website member over at davidpatrickherry.com forward slash register. And I will be putting that link. If, if anybody, um, if any of the mods can uh, help me out with some of those, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, here is uh, the register link. So part two, I'll record tomorrow evening and have that up over on the website. And that's where I'm going to really get into the Church Fathers, really get into Pseudo-Dionysius or St. Dionysius, a debated topic in, in Orthodoxy, get into Father Sarah from Rose, get into more of St. John Damascus and maybe some of the other Church Fathers. But to understand all those readings, so it's not overly convoluted, it's not too complicated, we need to get a good, strong foundational basis. And that's what we're going to be doing in this Part 1 video. So... Um, so just some of the things that I was reflecting on before getting, uh, because we have so much t uh, content to cover tonight, it's not going to be a big uh, intro rambling here. Uh, it's going to be much more straightforward, much more educational, just straight to the sources so we can talk about it. Um, but one thing that I thought uh, is useful to think about angels, and we know that angels comes from a Greek word regarding messengers, messengers of God. And we're going to get into the hierarchies and, and the multi, multiple distinctions among these sort of angelic powers, but the messengers of God are, as we'll learn, are specifically related to these more hominid type figures as opposed to the cherubim and the seraphim, even though they're all part of the sort of angelic order. 
And when I was thinking about what are some of the pop cultural understandings of angels and what they do, uh, one of the first things that came to mind is music, beauty, and that when we think of uh, angelic things, and I actually have a uh, the cherubic hymn here, I have a Georgian chant that I would love to share with you guys as well. It's absolutely beautiful, and so maybe one point we can play that. It's about a four-minute uh, uh, hymn um, from, um, from an Orthodox church over in the country of Georgia. But we think of music, we think of beauty in different ways, and I thought that really what we're thinking about when we think of angels is harmony, harmony. And that's central to the understanding of the structure of music itself and bringing uh, various uh, dimensions of uh, a a musical encord, a a chorus, a symphony together to create harmony. And in that harmony, you can hear the beauty. There's something aesthetically pleasing about that. Same thing with the sort of physical features of men and women, but beauty itself, artistic beauty. Uh, beauty in regards to sacred space, sacred dimensions. There's something that resonates with us. And when I thought about how we use the term angel, talking about beautiful things or harmonious things or music, it really comes down to this idea of harmony. And that as the messengers of God, really what angels are doing are, are, are they are mediators to try to bring the world back into accord with God's will, which is ultimate harmony, right? When we think of sacred geometry, fractals, uh, Mandelbrot sets, uh, we can think of music, uh, we can think of sacred space, that there's something very divine about harmony. And really, that's what we're called to as Christians, is that if we want the ultimate harmony in our lives to a degree because we live in a fallen world, but it's us aligning our own free individual will, our own little contribution to this choir, right? We talk about the choir of angels. Now, you and I aren't angels. One, because we're physical entities within space and time, um, and we have a different role in this sort of uh, in the sort of process of creation itself. Angels and ourselves, we're both created. We're both created entities, but you and I have physical bodies. We're in space and time, and in a way, we're in a very unique position in the order of creation. Angels are created entities that were, as we'll read, were created before the universe itself. They're in a sort of timelessness. They're in eternity. You and I are not. And when we think about God, the angels aren't gods. Absolute ontological distinction. They are created, right? But God didn't choose to become an angel. There is no reference. I, I, I say that, I say that though, at the same time, at the same time, as an Orthodox, when we think about the Old Testament, we think about the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. Now we know that was the Logos. When, when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he sees the backside of God, that is the Logos. So the Logos has always been the word of God. The second person of the Trinity has always been a sort of mediator also for us. Now he certainly not the same thing ontologically as an angel, but he incarnated as a man and he now exists in the heavenly sphere as a actual human man that's both fully God and fully man. And he's inside eternity with a physical body. Now it's a it's a divinized, it's a, it's a resurrected, it's a, it's a spiritual body. There's a lot of mystery rela- uh, surrounding how we understand the, what is the resurrected body? Because and this is a bit of a side note, but when we read scripture, you know, Christ resurrected. And at the same time, when he appeared to the apostles in the upper room, he could drink and he could eat. What's going on there? And so we see that there's like a soup. It's like a super real. It's super real <laughs> to use a really a non-theological term, but at the same time, he can go through the door to the upper room. So his, his body is almost more real than the door. But at the same time, he could eat and drink in front of the apostles. Or maybe that's just what it appeared to be. Uh, a lot of different understandings about that. But um, the angels occupy a really unique role. They're not men and they're not God. 
And so what do they do? I think a really interesting and useful way to think about them, we're going to get into more details uh, through these Orthodox articles, uh, listening to Father Seraphim, I mean, uh, <laughs> Father Spirit and Bailey, uh, and I have some other other resources. We'll even read, I got one, uh, one section here I want to read from St. John of Damascus, um, and I also got a clip right here from uh, John Meyendorf that I want to read, but... Um, Angels are, again, I think when we think about harmony, it's important because we'll see that the angelic war is in full force. When we think about the spiritual war, this is where you and I begin to become partners with the angels, is that the, the, the spiritual world, the war that I mean that is surrounding us is being fought, if you will, through Lucifer, Satan, the devil, and his demons. Remember, when Lucifer fell, he was an angel. Lucifer was the most beautiful and the most intelligent of the angels, but he loved himself. That narcissism, that self-pride, that self-worship took the most beautiful of God's created entities and took him to the lowest point that it could be. And so a third of the angelic hierarchy from our understanding followed Lucifer. Those are the demons. So Lucifer, Satan, the devil, uh, Diabolos, he and his angelic entities with him that we call demons are battling it out. So again, you see this war for harmony, the war for our souls, and you and I participate in this harmonization through our free will. And so this is where I think it's, it's interesting to think about the angelic war that's happening all around us, our role as human created entities. We're not angels. Angels also aren't gods and they're not full humans. We all occupy distinct roles within this sort of cosmic battle, this sort of cosmic uh, play out of free will, of, again, God giving created entities aspects of himself so they can participate in the fullness of who God is. Now, whether they choose to do that or not is another thing. And so, again, we can look at demons then as disharmonious. What do demons do in, in the world? We don't need to get into the ruling elite and many of the conspiratorial rabbit holes we could go down, but we can see that demons are real. We can see drug-addicted people. We can see um, how certain uh, ideologies in the world right now seem like they begin to possess people, um, that demons bring in disharmony. And so as the angelic choir sings, holy, 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 Lord of Sabaoth, it's about this harmony with God, about this harmony with ultimate reality where the demonic, the satanic, the evil forces that are, and we're all participating, both human and angels, human and angels and demons, we're all participating in the spiritual war. And harmony is the key thing that brings all these sort of free wills back into alignment with God. And so I think that as a basis is going to be my opening starting point uh, for today's stream. And then we got so many places that we can get into. Um, and so uh, and so actually, before we even dive into, let me, uh, well, here, let, let's just do a little housekeeping and then we'll get into everything. So if you guys can't smash that like button, I really, really would appreciate it. Also, if you guys would like to support Church of the Eternal Logos, throw in a super chat using the Streamlabs link. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I want to mention that if you are uh, appreciative and you'd like to support Church of the Eternal Logos and what I'm doing here, the best way that you could support is to become a website member over at the website, davidpatrickherry.com, churchwithetonallogos.com forward slash register. And there for $5 a month, you can become a website member to access exclusive video content of which the second half of this video, the part two is really going to be diving into some of the church fathers. Um, somebody like uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite or pseudo Dionysius, depending on where you stand. Uh, we're going to read a uh, second, ch the second chapter of the soul after death by Father Sarah from Rose. And so we're going to be what I want to do is really read to you guys uh, the way that other people have put it. And that's going to be the part two. And this part one's really going to establish the foundation to understand and interpret these things. So if that is something you'd like, you'd be interested in having gaining access to that second half, please 
uh, become a website member for $5 a month. I would greatly appreciate it. Also, if anybody would like to uh, purchase a one-on-one -on -one session, you can do so with the following link. If you guys would like to chat about theology, philosophy, mysticism, world religions, physical fitness, uh, goal setting for 2022, trying to get things in order, uh, you can do so with the following link here and purchase a one-on-one -on -one session. Then I will email you to set up a time on Thursday. Uh, slots are still open for this Thursday. If not, we'll we'll schedule it for next Thursday. And um, and then also, guys, uh, I see uh, Michael, the King of Kings. Thank you very much. Don't forget, guys, I mentioned it uh, previously, but I'm now over on Rockfin. Rockfin has graciously allowed me to become a content creator over on their site. So please uh, make sure you subscribe, create an account, subscribe to me over there. We're really building our Orthodox following over on Rockfin. So now it's Tristan, Jay Dyer, myself, and Brother Augustine all over on Rockfin. And so this is a free speech platform that, God forbid, anything were to happen to our followings and our ministries and our outlets here on YouTube. Um, we would all still be able to continue to stream, continue to create content over on Rockfin. And so slowly but surely, we're really building uh, a new stronghold for Orthodox content creation, Orthodox streaming that can't be censored. So when we talk about much of the chaos that's going on in the world right now, we can do that over on Rockfin much easier than we can here on YouTube. And so I, uh, I, I got the Rockfin going now. We got Church of the Eternal Logos, and I've just rebranded my old YouTube channel uh, to Religious Studies 101. So here, probably beginning of March, I'll be posting some new videos over on my old YouTube channel. That's, what, 80,000 subscribers, I think, um, on the Academic Study of World Religions. And that's, that channel is rebranded. It's now titled Religious Studies 101. And I'm going to be doing definitions of religion, philosophy of religion, diving into deeper concepts, how you study religion, all this type of thing, different aspects of world religions in a way to, to maybe create a bridge from those non-Christian people into Church of the Eternal Logos to maybe open their eyes and, and reappreciate some of uh, what Christianity can offer. Okay, so with that being said, now let's get into today's topic. So first thing that I want to do is let's see, do we want to watch uh, Father, Spirit, and Bailey first, or do we want to do a little bit of reading? Um, I guess we could do a little bit of reading first. So this was the general introductory article that I wanted to kind of go through. This is a really good baseline article to try to talk about uh, our topic today. So let me just get everything in place here. Okay. So... This is a site, uh, St. John the Evangelist Orthodox Church. I'll share that link. This link I'm sharing over on the YouTube live chat. So uh, sorry about that, Rockfin. But actually, I'll just throw that over here on Rockfin as well. There you guys go over on Rockfin. And um, let's just move through this real quick. It's not a long article, but it, it's, it's a nice introductory, introduction to what the church teaches. And then we're going to listen to uh, Father Spirit and Bailey uh, wax on the topic of uh, angels. So the Orthodox Church is teaching on angels, and this is from June 16, 2020. Uh, we hear about angels quite a bit in the Orthodox Church, in Scripture, in the liturgy, and even in our prayers. But what does the Church actually teach about them? In this post, we explore the Orthodox Church's different teachings on angels. And so here we go. Um, what are angels is the first one. <clears throat> Angel translates to mean messenger, which illustrates their purpose, to help the human race. From the days of man's life in paradise, mankind has known of their existence. In fact, we see an almost universal recognition of them in most other ancient religions. And maybe that would be another good uh, stream topic in the future is kind of look at um, uh, divine messengers, uh, transcendent e entities. Uh, yeah, I would say divine messengers across world religions. Then maybe that would be a, a good stream in, in the future. But um, moreover, in scriptures, we see many references to angels. And, and so I also have a few we're going to be diving into here in a bit. But one of the cherubim with a flaming sword guarded the gates of Eden at the expulsion of Adam and Eve of paradise. 
And we're going to speak a little bit more to uh, cherubim and what exactly that means. Abraham encouraged his servant by telling him the Lord would send his angel before him and prosper his way. Now, remember the three angels, the three strangers that Abraham hosts as well. When we look at the icon, the Orthodox icon of the Trinity, now, typically Orthodoxy, we do not portray any anthropological, anthropomorphic uh, descriptions of God the Father. God the Father remains transcendent. We only know God the Father through His Son, the Logos, who becomes Jesus Christ incarnate, and through the Holy Spirit, a direct encounter with God. And so uh, we typically then display or portray the, the Holy Trinity with the three angel reference over uh, when Abraham hosted those, what he believed to be were the three strangers. Of course, that was prefiguring uh, the, uh, the, revel- the full revelation of the Trinity, which again, we fully get with the incarnated Logos as Jesus Christ, the New Testament. Jacob saw angels both in a dream and when awake. Multiple references in the book of Psalms, the book of Job, and the prophets. An angel an angel announced the birth of both John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ. Angels sang the glory of Christ's nativity. The angel announced his birth to the shepherds and stopped the wise men from returning to Herod. Angels ministered to Christ during his temptation in the wilderness and appeared to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They announced his resurrection to the murmuring women, and at his ascension, they proclaimed his second coming. They loosened the bonds of Peter and other apostles, Acts 5, 19, 12, 7 through 15. An angel appeared to Cornelius, the centurion, telling him to send for Peter, who would instruct him in the word of God, Acts 10, 3 through 7. An angel announced to Paul that he was to appear before Caesar, Acts 27, 23 through 24. The vision of angels is the foundation for the revelation of St. John, the creation of angels. The first teaching of the Orthodox Church we'll look at regarding angels is their creation. And the creed we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. Before God created the visible world, he created the invisible, the angelic world, Colossians 1.16. Many teachers of the church express that God created the angels long before this world. Ambrose, Jerome, Gregory the Great, uh, Anastasius of uh, Sinai. And when the material universe was created, they already stood before the face of the creator and served him. What is the nature of angels? Secondly, the nature of angels. Secondly, the Orthodox Church teaches that angels are active, incorporeal spirits by nature. God endowed them with reason, will, and knowledge. They serve God, fulfill His will, and praise Him. And because they belong to the invisible world, they cannot be seen with our physical eyes. St. John of Damascus writes, quote, When it is the will of God that angels should appear to those who are worthy... They do not appear as they are in their essence, but transformed, take on such an appearance as to be visible to physical eyes. In the book of Tobit, the angel accompanying Tobit and his son says to himself, quote, All these days I was visible to you, but I neither ate nor drank. This only appeared to your eyes. Tobit twelve nineteen. Okay. Now the degree and perfection of angels. Here we go. Furthermore, angels are the most perfect spirits, superior to man in their mental and spiritual powers. As they are incorporeal, they are less confined by space and place and can travel vast distances instantaneously to appear where it is necessary for them to act. Additionally, in power and strength, they transcend all earthly authorities. As St. Peter teaches, 2 Peter 2.11 they are also immortal, Luke 20, 36. However, their immortality is not divine. That is independent and unconditional. 
Instead, it completely depends, like the mortality of human souls, on the will and mercy of God. And so we can, I want to say a few things right there, is we can look right there at the difference between the angelic heavenly hierarchy and the demonic. They're both angels. They're both created with that, um, with, with, with that conditional, it's a conditional immortality. And how do we understand that? This comes back to the Orthodox Church of the teaching of the river of fire. You see, God's love is a river of fire. There's only, and you've heard me say this multiple times, only God's uncreated energies have positive existence. The opposite of God's truth is not falsehood fighting its out. Evil is not fighting God's goodness. It's that the opposite of his uncreated energies have a negative existence, just like coldness is the absence of heat in energetic process. A shadow is the absence of light in energetic process. We see in the created world that there's really only a positive attribute of an energetic process, and we have terms, we have a dichotomy, we have a dualism in our mind, linguistic, that's not actually existent. Shadows and coldness are terms we use to describe the absence of an energy. When we talk theologically about evil, about lies, about greed, these things are absence of God's particular uncreated energies. And so it's through engaging in those energies that we can become deified through the process of theosis. And it's through those energies that the, even the angels themselves maintain that conditional immortality. Because when we look at Lucifer, when we look at Satan, when we look at the devil, and we look at the third of the angelic hierarchy that followed him into the abyss, in a way they already know how all this is going to end. And when we talk about the lake of fire, when we talk about the eternal hell, that is the experience of God's love in rejection. See, the metaphor is when you take on God's love, when you want to become more like God, when you've made that internal decision in your heart, which is something you can't give somebody, right? You have to make this internal decision. You know what? I'm actually going to try to become more godlike. I want to become better. I want to experience more of God. That when you do that, that's like you being a sword. All of us are kind of like swords. And when you put that sword in a fire, that fire is God's love. That fire heats up that sword. That sword becomes the same temperature as that fire. That, that sword doesn't burn. There's nothing to burn it. It enjoys that warmth because that, that fire, that heat purifies that blade. It, it cleans off all the detritus, all the debris that could be on top of that blade, on top of that sword. That sword becomes more perfected in the flame. That's what all of us are doing as we engage in those energies of God, as we participate in this process of theosis. But for some people, unfortunately, and it may be us, this is why we can never be uh, a totally sure of our own salvation. We must always be repentful, always be humble. But when we sin... We're, it's like taking that sword out of that fire, taking that sword out of that fire in that sinful process is like that blade getting wrapped around with moss or a fungus or things that begin to grow on it. And so uh, when we look at the world, when we look at people's noetic abilities, their news becoming dark, and it's like that sin is building up. It's building up on that uh, metaphorical blade, if you will, putting it in the fire. And because the lack of repentance, that lack of that humble heart, the lack of that person truly wanting to go on that journey, that blade becomes uh, dirtier and dirtier and dirtier to the point that when they go to stick that thing back in the fire, it's going to burn. It's going to burn because all that debris is going to be purified, cleansed off by that love of God, that fire, that flame. And so... You and I, as humans, unlike the angels, exist within space and time, given the opportunity to repent. This is actually an opportunity. You see, the, the, the demons don't have the same opportunity that you and I do. And so they will ultimately be destroyed. That, that immortality, getting back, to, getting back to the point of this first paragraph, that conditional immortality of angels, you see that that's actually going to be destroyed, that when Lucifer and his demonic hierarchy uh, get, uh, get in the presence of God's love inside eternity, post-judgment day, it's going to annihilate them. 
their existence is going to be destroyed. All that debris is going to be cleansed. It's all still God's love. You and I, that's what the spiritual war is all about then, is that those, those entities are trying to take as many human souls with them into that darkness, into that, that gross, dirty, filthy area where when you re-encounter God's love, that purifying flame, that purifying fire, it's going to burn. That's what hellfire is. But to the person who's choosing to be righteous, to the person who's choosing to repent, that fire is a warmth. That fire is a warmth that cleanses us and sets us free. So sorry for that little tangent there, but <clears throat> part of this degree of perfection of angels, despite the near perfection of angels, the Orthodox Church teaches that they still have limits. For instance, Scripture tells us they do not know the depths of the essence of God, which is known only to the Spirit of God. Moreover, and that's from 1 Corinthians 2.11, Moreover, they do not know the future, which is also known only to God, Mark 13, 32. Angels are also incapable of fully understanding the mystery of redemption, which they, quote, desire to look into, unquote, 1 Peter 1, 12. <laughs> they are even incapable of knowing all human thoughts, 1 Kings 8.39, and cannot perform miracles on their own, but only by the will of God, because that's what miracles are. This is a fundamental distinction between what ritual magic is, is me manifesting through really a sort of spiritual infrastructure, through spiritual means, I can... Uh, do things in a ritualistic way to attain my own will, my own desire, a miracle, yes, is a transformation, uh, potentially could be a, a tumor in remission, whatever, could be a drastic miracle one way or another. That's something that's God's will. Only God's will is what, is what it, it is God's will that differentiates what a miracle is versus what something magical might be. Lastly, they cannot be omnipresent. Scripture depicts angels as descending from heaven to earth or ascending from, from earth to heaven, which gives us reason to believe they cannot be on earth and in heaven at the same time. Very interesting there. The numbers and ranks of angels. Thirdly, the Orthodox Church teaches that the world of angels is immeasurably vast, that the angels are divided into nine different ranks, that Scripture supports of these teachings, first let us take a look at the vastness of the angelic world. Now, I want to I'm going to read just a, a couple paragraphs here from this is a very good book. I recommend this to a lot of inquirers into what orthodox theology is. It's called Byzantine Theology by John Meindorf. I highly recommend this book. I know Dyer has also uh, recommended this book. This is a really really good book if you're wanting to get an overview of the Orthodox Church and faith. I highly recommend this book. It's a great foundational text to start diving into some of the church fathers and some deeper theology. But uh, John Meindorf, um, he has three paragraphs here on angels, and I think it should be useful to state that uh, Dionysius or Pseudo-Dionysius, uh, however you want to interpret uh, his writings, certainly that can be a debated topic, he breaks the, the angelic hierarchy into nine um, John Meyerdorf wants to say, well, we, we can't be so, so, um, categorical in the way that we approach this stuff. Uh, he, he highlights, and we're going to read here is that it, there's obviously some Neoplatonic elements that that might be tied to, um, also, as we'll listen to Father Spirit and Bailey say that Father John Chrysostom says that there's numerous, numerous different hierarchies, far too many to count. So uh, maybe the nine hierarchies that are, are in Scripture uh, are useful for us to understand, to interpret, to cognize as, uh, you know, infantile uh, created humans. Um, but we have to be also hold it a little bit loosely, right? As is true with all things in orthodoxy, orthodoxy gives us something to hold on to, but we can never be so adamant, right? The seven deadly sins. Well, there's a lot of different sins. There's only, you know, there's only seven sacraments. No, the, the whole orthodox faith is sacramental. The whole theology is sacramental. So it's always a little give and take there, but uh, John Meindorf says, uh, Byzantine liturgy, when it proclaims the sanctification of the cosmos, it frequently mentions not only the, the demonic powers which have usurped authority over the world, but also the bodiless powers of heaven, 
who cooperate with God and man in the restoration of the original and natural order of the world. We see that, that harmony. You see the main role these angels play and all their different function is to bring harmony, to align with God's will, whether that be through miracles or through messages to uh, prophets of the Old Testament, uh, to apostles in the New Testament, to align people with God's ultimate will, to bring harmony. Yet Byzantium has never had a universally accepted system or description of the angelic world, with the exception of the celestial hierarchy of Pseudo-Dionysius, of what I just mentioned, in which each of the nine orders of angels is considered as an intermediary between the highest power above it and the in the form of existence below. The goal of Dionysius is to preserve inside an outwardly Christian system of thought a hierarchical concept of the universe adopted from Neoplatonism. In spite of its very widespread but rather uh, peripheral, and, and the, the whole adoption, may I and do need to say this, the adoption of Neoplatonism is a debated topic. Uh, Dyer sent me a very interesting article uh, within uh, the Orthodox world that typically secular people and even uh, people within the Orthodox world uh, of Meyendorf being one, uh, posit the apophatic, the apophatic theology, the negative theology of Pseudo Dionysius as being a later sort of Neoplatonic uh, interpretation of Orthodoxy. Others claim that what we call Pseudo Dionysius really is the Dionysius the Areopagite converted. I believe it's is it chapter eighteen in the Book of Acts. It's the chapter of the unknown God. Right, I've always thought that was so interesting that the unknown God was related to the the, the Dionysius the Areopagite or pseudo Dionysius who who put forward apophatic the negative theology, so the unknowingness of God. Anyways, um, but that's a debated topic within Orthodoxy. Some believe that maybe these writings actually come from Dionysius the Areopagite, and that the Neoplatonic tradition maybe. Uh, was influenced by him. It's hard to say. Uh, a lot of people, based on the grammar that's used in the original text, uh, believe that it's much later, uh, somewhere between 7th and 5th century. So, so just FYI there. In spite of its very widespread but rather peripheral influence, the Dionysian concept of the angelic world never succeeded in eliminating the more ancient and more biblical ideas about the angels. Particularly striking is the opposition between the very minor role ascribed to by Dionysius to the archangels, the rank second from the bottom of the angelic hierarchy, and the concept found in Jewish apocalyptic writings, including Daniel, Jude, and Revelation, where the, arch ang uh, where the archangels Michael and Gabriel rank as the chief captains of God's celestial armies. This idea has been preserved in the liturgy, which should be considered as the main and most reliable source of Byzantine angelology. Involved in the struggle against the demonic powers of the cosmos, the angels represent, in a way, the ideal side of creation. According to Byzantine theologians, they were created before the visible world, and their essential function is to serve God in his image, man. The scriptural idea that the angels perpetually praise God, Isaiah 6.3, Luke 2.13, is a frequent theme of the Byzantine liturgy, especially of the Eucharistic canons, which call the faithful to join the, chor the choir of angels, i.e. to recover the original fellowship with God. And again, a choir to, to establish that original harmony with God. This reunion of heaven and earth anticipated in the Eucharist is the eschatological goal of the whole of creation. The angels contribute to its preparation by participating invisibly in the life of the cosmos. So, again, that's John Meyendorf in uh, Byzantine Theology. I definitely recommend that for a lot of people. Let, now, with that being said, now we can listen to the nine hierarchies and all this stuff and have a little bit more of a caveat. Um, so the uh, number of ranks of angels. Thirdly, the, Orth the Orthodox Church teaches that the world of angels is immeasurably vast, that the angels are divided into nine different ranks. The scripture supports uh, both of these teachings. First, let us take a look at the vast vastness of the angelic world, vast numbers of angels. 
When the prophet Daniel saw the ancient of days in a vision, he saw the quote, thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousands of myriads attended upon him. Daniel 7.10. St. Krill of Jerusalem writes, Imagine how great in number is the Roman people. Imagine how great in number are the barbarian peoples that now exist, and how many must have died even in a century. Imagine how many have been buried in a thousand years. Imagine all mankind from Adam to the present day. Great is their multitude, but it is small in comparison with the angels, whose numbers are greater. They are the 99 sheep, whereas the human race is the one lost sheep. If it is written that a thousand, a thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousands of myriads attended upon him, this is only because the prophet could express no greater a number. When the numbers of the angels are so great, it is natural to assume that in their world, as in ours, there are various degrees of perfection and therefore various ranks of the heavenly powers, a hierarchy, in other words, nine ranks of angels. Orthodox teach, teaching divides the world of angels into nine ranks. These Again, this is from the celestial hierarchy of uh, Dionysius or Pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite. Because scripture lists only nine, the Orthodox Church does not teach more than these. But again, we'll see that uh, this is not a dogma. This is, um, we're in murky territory. Uh, Angelology is a a difficult thing to totally grab uh, in Orthodoxy. The first hierarchy is the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones. The second hierarchy are the powers, dominions, and authorities. The third hierarchy are the principalities, the archangels, and the angels. You can also find the listing of these ranks in the degrees of the apostles or in the works of many saints, including Ignatius the God-bearer, Gregory the theologian, John Chrysostom, Gregory the dialogist, and John of Damascus. St. Gregory the dialogist shows us where we can find the ranks of angels in Scripture. Quote, The existence of angels and archangels is witnessed throughout Holy Scripture. It is principally the books of the prophets, which mention cherubim and seraphim, the names of yet another four ranks are listed in the, by the Apostle Paul in the epistle to the Ephesians and also in the epistle to the Colossians. Thus, when those four of whom he speaks to the Ephesians, that is, to the principalities, the authorities, the powers and dominions, we add the thrones mentioned in the epistle of the Colossians. That adds up to five ranks of angels. And when to them we add the angels, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, we can see that there are nine ranks of angels. Are there more than nine ranks? Some of the church fathers believe the division of angels into nine ranks uh, covers only the names and ranks revealed to us in this life. St. John Chrysostom explains, but what evidence is there that there are more powers than those whose names are known to us? The Apostle Paul, when he mentions one of the series of ranks we know, also reminds of the others which we do not. When he writes of Christ, he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above the principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 1, 20-21, emphasis added. Ideas like these from the fathers are not regarded as the church as dogma or beliefs that cannot be disputed. Rather, they are simply personal opinions of individual fathers. Overall, the writers and teachers of the early church regarded the doctrine of the heavenly hierarchy as something mysterious. St. Dionysius writes on his on the celestial hierarchy, quote, how many ranks are how many ranks there are of heavenly beings, what their name is, and in what manner the mystery of holy authority is ordered among them, only God can know in detail. All that we can say about this is what God has revealed to us through them themselves because they know themselves. And St. Augustine likewise writes, quote, what there ex- there, That there exist thrones, principalities, dominions, and powers in the heavenly mansions, I believe most firmly, and I hold it as an undoubted uh, fact, that there are distinctions between them, that what exactly there are... What, what exactly they are like and what exactly are the distinction between them, I do not know. The seven archangels. 
Fourthly, the Orthodox teaches, Church also teaches that there are seven archangels, all of whom have their own names. In Holy Scripture, we find five of them. We find Michael, who is like unto God. We find Gabriel, who is man of God. Raphael, the help of God. Uriel, the fire of God. Or Jeremiah, the, high, the highness or mercy of God. And then we have uh, Salathiel or Faltiel, which is the prayer of or prayer to God. I'm sorry. Apart from these names, pious tradition gives yet another two names of angels: Jedutiel, the praise of God, and Barakiel, the blessing of God. Although these names do not appear in Holy Scripture, various listings exist with alternative names. However, in all cases, only seven names are actually given slash known. This is in agreement with the words of St. John in the Revelation, quote, Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which is to come, and from which the seven spirits which are before his throne. Revelation 1 verse 4. The purpose of angels. The purpose of angels. Fifthly, the Orthodox Church teaches that angels all have a purpose. Angels of the ranks closest to us, the third hierarchy, appear in Scripture as messengers or heralds of the will of God, guides for people and the servants of their salvation, Hebrew 1.14. Not only this, but they also hymn the glory of God to serve him in his plan, in of his providence for the material world. The fathers of the church often speak of this service. Some of them stand before the great God, while others, by their actions, support the whole world. St. Gregory the Theologian. Angels are set in command of the elements, the heavens, the world, and all within. St. Athenagoras. Each of them has received under his control some particular part of the universe, or is attached to some particular thing or person in the world, as is known to him, who arranges and orders all things, and all work towards one goal, by command of the builder of all things, St. Gregory the Theologian. Some ecclesiastical writers like Origen, got to be careful uh, with his neo Neoplatonism, uh, be careful with Origen, and Augustine expresses that certain angels are in charge of particular aspects of the kingdom of nature. This idea comes from the, Re comes from the Revelation, where we read of angels set in charge of certain physical elements by the will of God. Revelation 7, 1, 14, 18, and 16, 15. Moreover, according to the vision of the prophet Daniel, there are angels to whom God entrusts the fate of the kingdoms and peoples of the earth. Daniel um, 10 through 12. The Orthodox Church also teaches that every person has his or her own guardian angel unless he or she has driven him away by an evil life. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Take heed that ye despite not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 18.10 Good versus bad angels. Here we go. Lastly, the Orthodox Church teaches a distinction between good and bad angels and affirms the existence of both. As beings with reason, angels also possess free will. In other words, they are free to choose to do good and perform the will of God and are not merely forced to do so. However, the freedom to choose and to do good also comes with the freedom to do evil. Having this freedom, one of the angels chose wickedness before the creation of our visible world, and by so doing, from an angel of light, he became the devil, Lucifer, the most beautiful. The devil, also called Satan or the enemy, was created as a mighty and beautiful archangel, one of the most perfect and radiant. For this reason, the Lord gave him the name Lucifer, the light bearer. But he chose not to do the will of God. Lucifer lost sight of the path toward truth and life and light and concentrated his attention on his own perfection. He fell in love with himself and he forgot that all his perfections were the gift of God. Instead, he was so blinded by the idea of his own greatness that he rose against his Lord and took with him a large number of spirits who accepted his authority. 
The archangel Michael took command of the angels who remained faithful to God and waged war with the fallen spirits, again, long before the material world existed. Ultimately, light conquered darkness and the rebels were hurled into the abyss. Could Satan become good again? Satan's hardness of heart continues further and further downwards to this day. One sin leads to another. Pride leads to envy and spite, which resort to lies and false witness and so on. But can't he repent? After all, our merciful God accepts our repentance, so wouldn't he also receive Satan's as well? One hermit who pondered over this received a revelation from an angel who told him that forgiveness is always possible for those who repent. When the devil appeared before this holy man sometime later, the hermit repeated the angel's comforting words, but the devil merely burst into laughter in response. Stubbornness, hardness of heart, and pride can eventually reach such a level that a sinner no longer wishes to make use of the means of salvation. This is the curse of pride. It no longer desires salvation and perishes. Thus the angelic world of light divided. Some angels faithful to the Lord remain in light, joy, love, and gratitude, piously serving God and continue to make progress toward closer union with the Lord. And they have gone so far in their work and in the path of grace, they have developed such a habit of goodness that none of them can or will will rebel against God now. Conclusion, the Orthodox Church teaches various things about angels regarding their creation, nature, purpose, and names. She also takes care to distinguish those angels who choose good and those who choose evil, highlighting the concept of free will. Have any questions, have any questions about these teachings? Uh, feel free to reach out. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to watch a little Father, Spirit, and Bailey on this topic. And this is a video, a recent one from November of last year, so just a few months old. And this is on the true nature of the angels. So enjoy this one, and then we'll dive back into a little bit more reading. One of the errors that non-Orthodox cultures have fallen into is to romanticize ideas about angels, the angelic hosts, and the unseen reality that surrounds us. In fact, it's led to a, a completely heretical understanding of who the angels are, what they do, why they exist, and of course, the nature of demons. The existence of angels is first recorded there even in paradise and the word angel means literally messenger this is one of their roles throughout particularly the new testament we see there jesus himself encountered angels that sustained and encouraged him in the garden of gethsemane the holy theotokos received a message from gabriel the angel gabriel brought a good tidings and a message that she could conceive the child St. Joseph was warned by the angels. The shepherds saw the angels announcing the glory of Christ's birth. The Magi were warned by the angels to take another route. The myrrh-bearing women encountered angels at the tomb, and so on and so on. So the angels bring the will of God, express and communicate the will of God to man. But they are very real created beings. We must move away from this romantic idea of who and what they are. They are created beings who have a will and have an intelligence. Sometimes it can be a surprise to people to think of angels in this way, having a will and an intelligence. They are fleshless. That means they, they move without restriction. They can move instantaneously one place to another, but they cannot be in two places at the same time they are finite and so when they are coming from heaven to bring a message they are no longer in heaven unlike god who is everywhere simultaneously the angels can only be in one place at one time and the angels cannot hear or read or or know our inner thoughts only god knows our inner thoughts so they see and they perceive, but they don't know the inner workings of our heart and mind. 
and they are active. They are active in that they are constantly at work. Their immortality is not by nature. They are given immortality by God's grace. God wills that they be immortal. And so they are. And they are a great number. Far more angels exist than human beings. Some of the fathers interpret the, the parable of the, the lost sheep, the one sheep that goes missing, and the 99 that are still in the sheepfold. Some of the fathers say that one sheep that went lost represents humanity, and the 99 are the angels. Now, this isn't a literal ratio, but it gives us an idea of the, the far superior number of angels there are to all the human beings that have ever lived. And these great hosts of angels are divided, we are told, into ranks, many ranks. Now, some of the fathers specifically name numbers, like nine ranks of angels and so on. And there is some difference amongst the fathers about the number of ranks they identify. St. John Chrysostom actually says, there are many more ranks of angels than we ever know. We just do not know the extraordinary number of angels and ranks of angels that exist serving God. So why then did God create the angels? What is their purpose? Their first and most important purpose is simply to reflect the glory of God. To reflect the glory of God and to participate in his blessedness. Participate in the glory and blessedness of God. In his goodness. God has created them to participate in this. And they of course are there to reveal God's will to us as messengers. And there are angels, we are told, who are created to sustain the elements of creation. In these days where people become so afraid of issues to do with the environment and in threat of environmental disaster, well, it is a comfort to know that there are angels who govern the elements. They watch over and take care of the created order. Another romanticized idea in the West particularly is that of the guardian angel. It is the church's teaching that every one of us is appointed an angel to watch over us, to care for us, to pray for us. Appointed by God to be with us through our life. Well, it's important that we recognize that our way of life affects our relationship with that angel. If we live sinfully, if we live and give ourselves to the passions, we tear ourselves away from the influence and the guidance and the protection of our guardian angel. It's very important that we try to live as closely to the angel as we can. Seek his prayers. Ask our guardian angel to pray for us. Just as we ask the saints to pray for us, ask our guardian angel to pray for us. Somebody is using a, a chainsaw on their forest over there. These are the angels, and the, the nature of the angels is such that they were there before the world itself was created. We're told in the creed, God is the maker of all things visible and invisible. And the invisible there refers to the angels and the angelic hosts. And in Genesis, in Genesis we read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens here do not mean the, the physical space above the earth, the sky. The heavens means the, the place of the dwelling of the, the invisible hosts of angels. Now they have will and they have intelligence, which leads us to the fact of the fallen angels. They're is a host of angels that fell with Satan, that was rejected by God from heaven and became the demons. And they possess these qualities that we have described of the angels. They are intelligent, they are experienced. They have lived for many millennium. They know in their experience how to lead men to fall. And so we must guard ourselves. We must be very careful. They have chosen to use their freedom that God grants them for rebellion. Because the first sin there was pride. Seeing the glory that he reflected from God, Satan fell in love with his own reflection. And 
wanted to be worshipped, wanted others to worship him, and so he was cast out. We must guard ourselves, for, for pride is the cause of, of a whole tree of other passions and sins. Pride caused an angel and many angels with him to fall from heaven. This is the danger of pride. We must watch our hearts very carefully for it. And now the demons, with all their experience and intelligence and their speed, seek to attract us, human beings, to evil. This is what they do in the world, to tempt us, to feed us, feed our passions and our desires and our base longings. Even our Lord himself, who was sinless, was tempted by the demons. Satan came and tried to tempt him. How much more do they play with us? And when we give ourselves to the passions, when we give ourselves to evil and sin, the howls of delight, the howls of laughter that we are surrounded by is inaudible, but it's there. The demons mock and laugh when we sin. So we must beware not to give ourselves in any way to anything that is of the demons. We're told both in scripture, in our hymns, in the lives of the saints and the fathers, the demons occupy the aerial realms. They do now occupy the space between the heavens and the earth. This is their place of movement. This is why these UFO phenomena and so on exist in the air. They seek to deceive, to confuse. But we must remember, like the angels, they don't know our inner thoughts. They don't know the depths of our heart. They are simply creatures, intelligent, experienced, but creatures nonetheless. And so they are incomparably inferior to the infinite power and glory and majesty of God. And so we must not fear them. We must not fear the demons. Do not be afraid. Trust in God's love and God's protection. St. Paisios often referred to our angels as our big brothers. He said, turn to your big brothers. Ask them to pray for you. Seek their guidance. They love us. They pray for us. They wish for our salvation. So let their, their influence into our lives. And the greatest way that we can do this, and the greatest way that we can draw close to all the angels is through obedience to God. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 18.10. There will be some who abandon the faith to false inspirations and doctrines taught by the devils, 1 Timothy 4, one. The best thing on earth is a pious man. The best thing in heaven, the nearer in place and purer, is an angel, the partaker of the eternal blessed life. But the nature of the Son is most perfect. St. Clement of Alexandria. And so that was what I wanted to talk to you guys about, a uh, general introduction to the nature of angels. We had our Orthodox article, and then we had Father, Spirit, and Bailey. Now, if you look over here, uh, here I'm, not, I'm just going to share these links fairly quickly. i got a lot of stuff I can share with you guys here. This is OrthoWiki. This, I, I've mentioned and used this as a resource before. Uh, it, it, it is useful. So if you guys, this is the OrthoWiki. Uh, again, if you want to read some stuff on your own time, uh, you can look to, uh, look to that article and then... Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the seraphim. And so the, the seraphim, our Orthodox Wiki article on seraphim, pretty short, pretty short here. Um, but it says the six winged seraphim are the angels closest to God. Isaiah 6, 2, who due to their closeness to God resemble fire. Remember, we talked about the river of fire. God's love is a fire. 
That is what the eternal hellfire is. It's not a place that God sends you, commands you to be. It is his eternal love in full force, in full movement as an energetic process that you as a free will entity either choose to be annihilated by due to the gross uh, accumulation of debris, of sin, or you comp- you continue to repent, you humble yourselves, and you're warmed, you're cleansed, you're purified by that fire. We both we all go through the fire. It's just it only burns certain people. So it's interesting to hear that the the seraphim and, and guys, I'm sure you've seen this little depiction of the six wing. Next time you go into an Orthodox church, now you're going to know what that is. That's the seraphim. And so uh, the the seraphim, you, you've probably seen it. Here's another icon. Uh, when you go into an Orthodox church, now you're going to see some of these different angelic entities. You'll be able to decipher, identify, know a little bit more about them. And so, uh, again, they resemble fire. Hebrews 12, 29, Daniel 7, 9, Exodus 24, 17, Psalm 103, 4. Due to the closeness to God and their appearance, they were given the name seraphim, which in Hebrew means flaming. They are aflame with love for God. Again, remember the river of fire, God's love. It's all biblical. It's all there. It's all in the Bible. It just takes it just takes orthodoxy to bring it all together to give you the lens to reinterpret this stuff. So they are aflame with love for God and kindle others to such love. The river of fire. So here's a few verses then we can look into. Um, let's see, what were the some that they mentioned? Uh, Hebrews 12.29. Is Hebrews on here? Uh, Hebrews. Let me just pull it up. Hebrews 12.29. I, I want to read some of these. I thought they were on here. 12.29. Uh, can we get, dang it. We get a little bit more here. There we go. Uh, therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God, accepting with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrew 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? That's exactly what I was trying to hint at. Uh, Daniel seven, nine, is he on here? Let's see. Uh, command find Daniel here. Seven, 10, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Command find. There we go. Let's go to the top. Okay, so in regards to the seraphim, we see Isaiah 6, 2. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Isaiah 6, 1 through uh, 13, so including that. So this is a full description of the seraphim. And the year that King uh, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of this of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, and with he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me for I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Aha. Um, that let's see. Are there any other specific? Uh, looks like Isaiah is one of the few places where we see the the term seraphim described specifically. Let's go to Psalm one hundred three, four. Uh, 
Psalm 103.4 reads, um, giving context, beginning with verse 3, He who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with loving devotion and compassion, who satisfies you with good things, that your youth is renewed like the eagle's wings. Okay, well, I'm not sure why that is specifically referred to the seraphim, but anywho... The next one I wanted to talk about is the cherubim. We, we again we we talk about we sing about the cherubim and the seraphim every liturgical service, right? And so the cherubim, the many-eyed cherubim, second with the seraphim is in the angelic hierarchy stand before the all-knowing God in in, in ineffable radiance. They are always radiant with the light of the knowledge of God and his wisdom and with the knowledge of the mysteries of God, named cherubim, meaning great understanding or effusion of wisdom in Hebrew. They are enlightened, and therefore, through the cherubim, wisdom is sent down to others. An enlightenment of the spiritual eyes is given to see God and have knowledge of him. In other words, the Lord dwells between the cherubim, 2 Samuel 6, 2, representing the mysteries above. And the Old Testament figures of cherubim de uh, decorated the sanctuary. A pair of cherubim made by gold was ordered to be placed on the mercy seat in between the Lord spoke to his people. Exodus 25, 17 through 22. Figures of cherubim were woven on the veils of the tabernacle. In the divine liturgy, the song of cherubim is sung in the liturgy of faithful representing cherubim between whom the world, the Lord dwells. And so I want to, I want to play this one. This is the cherubic hymn. It's a Georgian chant. I thought this one was, was uh, beautiful. Again, when we sing uh, every liturgy, we sing the cherubic hymn, but here is a version of some professional chanters um, in a Georgian, in a Georgian chant by St. Simeon Orthodox church choir. So check this out. Uh, and again, let the let the angelic radiance, the holiness, kind of just resonate with you here.
Beautiful, 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 beautiful. So this is going to begin to wind down this stream, guys. You kind of this has been a great introduction. I have another article here, and just regarding to the seraphim, we just uh, we just listened to a great, um, a beautiful rendition. Um, again, representing the mysteries above. I believe we read the whole cherubim article here, but here's a few places in scripture where we see. Uh, the cherubim mentioned Hebrews 9 5 above the ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover but we cannot discuss the things in detail now Genesis 3 24 after he drove the man out he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and the flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life Exodus. So we again, even in there, we see we see a sword reference. We see the flames. We see God's love. We see the tree of life. Again, for those of you who are listening who aren't Orthodox, uh, in Orthodoxy, we don't believe that we were never to partake in the tree of life, like the Gnostics, right? The Gnostics say, "Oh, that that evil God of the Old Testament, you guys had the tree of life, and He was never going to let you eat of it." Think God Eve did, and that's why we can get gnosis. That's why we can escape this hellish creation that's a, a, as ancient gnostic and generally speaking again varied amongst traditions but orthodox teaches that uh we would partake of the tree of life it's that adam and eve were adolescents and so uh, so a, an interesting understanding is that um, even though Christ is the second Adam, Adam and Eve do not represent where we were going to that's not the end point that's not the telos of human creation they were in a pre-fallen state. They were in a more harmonious uh, understanding and relationship to creation and God. But they were children. And so as children, they were not spiritually ready for the tree of life. Just like you do not give steak to a child, they will choke on it and die. Same as if the spiritual understanding, the spiritual children of Adam and Eve, even though they were fully you know, uh, uh, anatomically adult humans, they ate from the tree of life of which they were spiritual children. They choked on it and died, so to speak. Remember, it brought in sin. It brought in the understanding. They weren't ready for this awareness yet. And so God uh, protecting them from, from further uh, exacerbation of what they've just caused places the cherubim on the uh, ends of the Garden of Eden to prevent them from coming back. So, anyways, I digress. Exodus 26, 31, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker. 1 Kings 8, 6 through 7, the priest then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark and overshadowed the Ark and it's carrying poles. Exodus 26, 1. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains. Finally, oh, we just read that. Psalm 18, 10. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. Ezekiel 10, 14. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One face, that of a cherub. The second, the face of a human being. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Exodus 25, 18 through 20. And make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherub on one piece with a cover and the other at two ends. And then it, uh, the cherubim are to have wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover of them. The cherub are to face each other, looking toward the cover. And so, let's see, First Kings, Psalm 80. Hear us, shepherd of Israel. You who led Joseph in a flock, you who sent enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Psalm 99 verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. So uh, these are just, I just pulled up a few Bible verses here uh, that have cherubim in it. But anyways, so we see that there are different orders of angels. We have archangels, we have guardian angels, we have maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, again, this is ultimately a mystery, and, and we can only get this mystery, mystery uh, brought to us through 
various revelations, of which is the book of Revelation. And that's where we understand how Michael is the archangel who's battling the demons. Um, and then we also have Dionysius to talk about these very angelic hierarchies. And so the cherubim and the seraphim, who we sing about uh, in the Cherubic Hymn, for example, these have Old Testament references. These are entities that are in the direct presence of God. Uh, these are have a little bit of a different function, even though they're still angelic entities. They're not Gabriel. They're not Raphael. It's not Michael. It's not your holy, holy guardian angel. But again, they all work for the harmony, for the glory, for the fulfillment of God's will. Now, I had a few more things that we could touch on. This was a few little sayings from different church fathers on angels and demons. Um, I can share this if anybody wants to read some of this. It actually uh, comes from a Catholic website I found, but uh, if you guys want to see that, you can do so there. Um, also, this is a really good article. It's a little bit more in-depth, and it was going to be too time-consuming for me to incorporate into all aspects of our stream, so I didn't. But this is a really good uh, article. Uh, I'll share the whole thing. This is from Orthodox Info. And so if this is something you guys would like to read later, feel free. Um, I'll just read a few things from this one that kind of speak more than the opening article, which is a great general overview. But, uh, for example, the creation of the angels. Uh, this one had a better description than uh, the other, uh, other one, which was much smaller. The symbol of faith, we find the following words. Uh, actually, that, that repeated. It was just bigger. Yeah, this one was just bigger. Um, so I think the other one ended here. As the goodness or love of God could not find satisfaction in contemplating himself, he wished to spread his goodness even further so that the number of those who could enjoy it should be as great as possible, for such is the nature of the highest form of goodness. And so God first thought of the angelic heavenly powers, and thought became act carried out by the word and fulfilled by the spirit. And his first creation was pleasing to him. He then devised another world, material and visible, and a well-balanced unity between heaven and earth and that which is between them. Qu unquote. This idea of St. Gregory is echoed in the work of St. John of Damascus. I actually have... Um, I actually have... Uh, yeah, part of chapter three uh, in the Orthodox faith, book two. So I think it's the exact same uh, reference here. I have some John Damascus. I wanted to do that in part two. I didn't want to overwhelm. Um, and then I wanted to say a little bit more about the conflict between good and bad, because I think this is this is important regarding how we we have our own role again in this spiritual war, this spiritual war that's going on. Um, I also, what was the article? Oh, here it is. This was another article that was, that was worth uh, checking out for anybody who's just getting into such a topic. Um, so, uh, prayer to our holy guardian angel. For some of you may not be familiar with this one. But here is a prayer to our guardian angel. O holy angel, attendant of my wretched soul and my passionate life, neither forsake me a sinner nor shrink from me because of my lack of self-control. Grant the subtle demon no means of mastering me through violence to my mortal body. Strengthen my poor and feeble hand and guide me in the way of salvation. O holy angel of God, guardian and protector of my wretched body and soul, forgive me all wherein I have offended you every day of my life and for whatever sins I may have committed during the past night. Protect me against the present day and guard me from every temptation of the, e of the enemy so that I may not anger God by my sin. And pray to the Lord for me that he may strengthen me in his fear and make me his servant worthy of his goodness. Amen. And so this, again, what is an angel? Uh, talks about the creed again. Are angels superior to humans? This was hint on, hit, uh, hinted at in our, early, our opening article. Uh, angels are not the highest power. Uh, so I'll read this. Angels are not the highest power. As wonderful and helpful as angels are, though, let us not forget who is behind these wonderful creations. It is God. 
The same God who created humanity out of his infinite love also created the angels out, out of his infinite love. We understand that angels are a reflection of God's glory and exist to serve as God's messengers and yet are so much more than that. Quote, an angel is an image of God, a manifestation of the invisible light, a uh, burnished mirror, bright, untarnished, without spot or blemish, receiving, if it is reverent to say so, all the beauty of the absolute goodness, and so far as may be kindling in itself the unalloyed radiance, the, go the goodness of the secret silence, St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Again, some of this stuff I'd love to read to you guys. Uh, there's, I, I can't read the whole celestial hierarchy to you. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff in here that, uh, again, in part two, which will be at the website for members, uh, we're going to be diving into. Um, in, in, in this uh, this book, too, for, with uh, St. John Damascus, let me just read a little bit out of this one real quick, too. Angels stand before God and behold the face of the Lord. The more we become properly aware of the role that angels have played in the salvation history of humanity, we become more strengthened in our capacity for good. But more importantly, we become more capable of, of detecting and resisting the temptations and traps that Satan will lay before us. Angels then are more than mere helpers, as television and movies would have us understand. Angels are the bearers of the very name and power of God. They are the light and strength of the Lord. Father Evan Maximuk. Um, and again, uh, I, I'm not going to read any of this. This is a really good article, though. Did I already share this one? Uh, uh, yeah, Orthodox Info. Uh, definitely check it out, guys. It, it, this one, uh, this is. It looks like most of the articles we read were actually picking from this one, uh, but it would, it would just take too long for us to read the whole thing, so I didn't. Um, and then it, when you check out the, well, let me do it real quick. I'll do it real quick. Last thing I wanted to do. There's. Uh, terrible visuals, but this clip right here is talking to an Orthodox iconographer. Um, and I thought it was a little bit interesting how they talk about um, uh, iconography and how he depicts angels. So we'll just, it's just three minutes long. We'll watch just that for a minute. And then, uh, and then I may read something real quickly because we're get, we're coming out of time here. And then uh, we'll hit the super chat. So again, if you guys would like to support this stream, feel free to send in a super chat using the Streamlabs link. Would greatly appreciate it. But uh, here is check out this last video clip for us. You really don't kind of have the freedom to create it from scratch. You're working with characteristics in mind. That's that's absolutely right. Uh, as an iconographer, we don't create anything new uh, per se, unless of course a new saint comes along. Um, but uh, we paint from uh, older icons so that we keep the, uh, the, the art ancient. Well, let's take a look at some icons. I think one of the most common we were talking offset are Gabriel and Michael. These are archangels. There archangels. are many ranks of angels, and they are archangels, and have a, a set that you've written, as yes. we say, in the Orthodox Church. Why don't you compare and contrast Michael and Gabriel? How would I know who is who? Um, Typically, they will they will have uh, contrasting colors, blue and red. Uh, usually, uh, one would have blue on the uh, the, the tunic and, and red on the mantle, uh, and 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 reversed on the other side. Uh, in these particular instances, obviously, one's a full figure and one is not. Um, the uh, when seen together as a set, one will hold I C and one will hold X C, which is of course the Greek abbreviation for Jesus Christ. Um, but typically, reading the name would really give it, give it away for you. The clue. Yeah. And we can see here when you talked about some of the characteristics of facial features right. and iconography that you carry the same thing for human beings and angels. There's really right. And they're shown expressionless as well. Okay. Uh, there are lots of applications of angels in iconography. Yes, there are. Um, one that you've brought today to share with us uh, is this one. This is actually an icon of, the, as we call her, the Theotokos, or the Mother of God, right. holding the Christ child. But we've got angels in here. Why don't you tell us about the application of angels in other icons? Sure. The, the, uh, the um, legend here is that, that Christ uh, had angels appear to him uh, holding the instruments of his death. So you can see the, the cross and the crown of thorns and the nails uh, and the spear and the sponge. And uh, Christ as a child was, was, was frightened by that vision. And uh, he ran to his mother. And in his haste, you can see his, his slipper uh, fell off. That's okay. the story behind this particular icon. I see. Now, other applications of angels. Here's another icon that you've written. 
Um, maybe you can describe this to us and, and what this is. Uh, in the Gospels, unless I'm mistaken, this is never uh, uh, referred to specifically as Gabriel, but we, we, we um, take it to be Gabriel because he was the messenger of God for the most part. Um, Gabriel appears to the myrrh-bearing women at the tomb uh, to tell them that Christ is uh, gone from the tomb. Uh, and you see he's shown all in, in, in white and gray, which is a little bit different from, from the red and blue that they're typically seen with. And why is that? Um, I believe it's because it's, it's after the, the resurrection of Christ. Okay. And we have just a, a few moments left, but we also wanted to talk a little bit about the application of angels as others within the context. And tell us very briefly about this. Briefly, this is an icon by uh, St. Andre Rublev. Um, and he depicts the hospitality of Abraham, uh, the Holy Trinity here, as three angels who are equal uh, in a triangular fashion, uh, all sitting around uh, the table in, in, in a very equal pose. It's, it gives us a good understanding of what the Trinity is. Okay, so we see lots of applications for angels in the iconography Absolutely. of the Orthodox Church. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us. It's really my enjoyed pleasure, it. John. Thank you. And stay with us. We're going to go back to Quail. Okay, so that is going to conclude any of the uh, online online sources I had for uh, for uh, today's video and I'm going to dive into these super chats in just one quick moment but just uh, and I saw uh, so much good stuff in these books again for part two of this stream guys we're going to be diving into St. John Damascus uh, Father Sarah from Rose Pseudo Dionysius um, on angels the celestial hierarchy a little bit more details now that anybody who watched this video is going to have a, a basically a basic understanding, but here's just a quick little snippet of what you'll get in part two of this video, reading some of these church fathers. And so um, this is concerning angels and, and uh, St. John Damascus describing what exactly they are. And he says, uh, he is the maker and creator of the angels. He brought them from nothing into being and made them after his own image into a bodiless nature. Some sort of spirit, as it were, an immaterial fire. As the divine David says, quote, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a burning fire? And he determined their lightness, fieriness, heat, extreme acuity, their keenness and the desire for God in his service, and their being raised up and removed from every material consideration. So an angel is an intellectual substance ever in motion, free, incorporeal, ministering to God with the gift of immortality in its nature. And, it, and he'll go on in here and say this is actually by grace. And the form of the definition of this substance only the creator understands. Now, compared with us, the angel is said to be incorporeal and immaterial, although in compassion with God, who alone is incomparable, everything proves to be gross and material, for only the divinity is truly immaterial and incorporeal. So the angel is of a nature which is rational, intelligent, free, and variable in judgment, that is, subject to voluntary change. It is only the uncreated which is unchangeable. Also, every rational being is free. The angelic nature, then, is so far as it is rational and intelligent, is free. While, in so far as it is created, it is changeable and has the power to preserve and progress in good or to turn to evil. Although man, by reason of the infirmity of his body, is capable of repentance, the angel, because of his incorporeality, is not. The angel is immortal, not by nature, but by grace. For naturally, everything that has a beginning also has an end. Only God is always existing, rather transcends always, because he who made the times is not subject to time, but transcends it. The angels are secondary spiritual lights who receive their brightness from that first light, which is without beginning. They have no need of tongue and hearing. Rather, they communicate their individual thoughts and designs to one another without having recourse to the spoken word. And so, and he continues and goes into actually discussions of the logos and stuff like that and the Holy Spirit. So again, we're going to be diving into more of the sort of detailed theology um, in part two of this video. So make sure if you guys can, uh, if you would like to, please, uh, 
purchase a website membership for $5 a month, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. You'll have access to an exclusive video library and you'll be able to access part two. I may post part two also over on Rockfin for premium members. So uh, stay tuned. I may post that over there as well. Of course, we're streaming this stream right now over on Rockfin. So shout out to anybody who's watching over on Rockfin. Uh, God bless you all. And make sure to also subscribe to me over on Rockfin if you guys can. So with that being said, now let's dive into uh, dive into some of these super chats. First super chat tonight comes from Truth Eli. Thank you very much, brother. A consistent supporter of the stream. Truth Eli throws in five dollars and says, uh, when we do not when we we do not pray to created things. Jesus prayed to God alone to show humans how to do it. Is the truth greater than tradition? Amen to that. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Truth, Eli. I don't think you understand. Jesus prayed to God alone to show humans how to do it. Is the truth greater? Th <laughs> oh, oh, truth, Eli. It looks like we have a, a Protestant uh, Sola Scriptura person who... Uh, there, all you have to do this your your super chat comes with a presupposition that uh, again that somehow if you pray to something you're asking for some, it to do something we're asking to other people to pray when you ask somebody else to pray for you is the same way in which you pray to these created things so your entire uh, super chat here is totally unfounded uh, multiple category errors and I really it shows that you have no idea what you're talking about in regards to Orthodox theology now I appreciate the support truth Eli but this is a very insightful this comment that you you really need to dive a little bit deeper in Orthodox theology because you've missed the whole thing right there petitioning and communicating with the Holy Trinity through prayer is not the same thing by asking a buddy, hey, I'm going through a tough time. Can you pray for me? That's what we do when we petition our angels or petition uh, the Theotokos to pray for us. We're not praying to them to do anything. So the whole premise of the super chat makes no sense. But anyways, thank you very much, brother, for your support and God bless you. Next super chat comes from George of the Hut. It said, you stated that the devil and his angels will be annihilated. Will you clarify? I understand that we don't believe in annihilation. Um, well, the, the idea is that they lose their, they lose their identity. They lose their eternality. You, the only way that you can become eternal is by participating in God. After Judgment Day, which is an eternal judgment, those who are deemed on the wrong side of that aren't going to participate in that uh, graciousness, God's grace, to have eternal being, to have life after death. So that's what I mean by annihilated. Uh, I don't know if you're going into specific semantics or specific um, specific ways in which um, uh, uh, you're understanding the term annihilated, but... Um, that, uh, that's typical theology is that it, the only people who are going to be eternal are those who participate in God's kingdom, which is eternal. You only get there through God's grace by being deemed worthy. So that's what I meant by that. Uh, feel free to reach out, George. I really appreciate the super chat of if you, um, if you're talking about a specific use of the term annihilation or something. Um, next super chat comes from Keenan Beat. Shout out to Keenan Beat. Throws in $10. Says, I'm reading the, the Law of God by Father Daniel uh, Sisoev right now, and I couldn't recommend it enough for catechumens and choirs. I just started on the chapter on the angelic world tonight. God bless. Well, <laughs> a little providential, a little synchronistic activity there. Uh, thank you very much, Keenan, uh, for all the support, brother. Shout out to you. God bless you and your family. Hope everybody's doing well. And, um, and thank you brother for the support and, and keep on keeping on, man. I, I can't wait to see you get fully brought into the church. Um, so really looking forward to that day. Uh, we've been, we've been chatting on your journey. I mean, it's, you've been an Orthodox journey well over a year now. So shout out to you, brother. God bless you and everything you're doing next super chat. Special. Thank you guys goes to crispy Johnson tonight. Thank you very much. Crispy Johnson. I truly, truly appreciate it. Uh, throws in a hundred dollar super chat. Whoa. Thank you so much. Crispy Johnson, man. Uh, great brother, uh, European brother. I believe he's over in Ireland. 
And uh, always here in the Super Chats, always here for the streams, always active in our community. And a very generous Super Chat. Thank you so much, brother. Thanks for all the laughs. Thanks for all the jokes. Thanks for all your camaraderie in the live chats and for all the different ortho channels. Thank you so much, uh, Crispy Johnson, man. Really, really appreciate it. That is a very charitable uh, donation. I really appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Uh, next super chat comes from uh, Janie Sophia. And again, uh, Crispy Johnson just said thank you. So no comment there. So thank you again, Crispy Johnson. Uh, next one comes from Janie Sophia. She throws in $20. Thank you so much, Janie. And she says, excellent stream as usual. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Janie Sophia, for a $20 super chat. I really appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. And I'm glad that you liked it. I thought uh, this would be a very... Um, a very useful stream for a lot of people. So thank you very much. Um, next super chat comes from the green feathers brother. Thank you. He has been very generous in his support of the stream. Shout out to our brother over at the, the green feathers. Uh, go give him a subscription over on YouTube on his YouTube channel. Thank you so much, brother. He says my patron saint is St. Raphael, the archangel. I love the book of Tobit. Yes. Yep. 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 Uh, I, I was thinking about even met referencing uh, uh, Raphael because he mentions that, you know, I you thought I was eating with you, but this was more just an appearance. I, I he, At the end, he reveals, I think it's chapter 12, that he reveals that he's an angel. Um, so the Green Feathers, thank you so much. $40 Super Chat, thank you so much, brother. Like, really support all, all, all. I really appreciate all your support. God bless your family, man. I hope you're doing well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, man. Um, really appreciate that. Next super chat comes in from, uh, Francisco, uh, Franci, Franci, Frankie, uh, Francisco Franci is what I'm going to say. Sorry. I'm probably butchering it, but, uh, Francisco $10. Thank you so much. Says, Hey, DPH, I know this is off topic and maybe you could answer it in another video. You talked about men not being the men they need to be to attract a traditional woman. Do you think you'd be willing to do a collab with Rouge on Red Pill from Ortho? Yeah, I think that would be uh, that'd be a, a useful crossover and, and topic to discuss. Um, don't want to go into it too much here, kind of running out of time, but... Um, May do. I was wanting to do a video criticizing the manosphere, so maybe that would be a good uh, video here on the on this channel to to criticize the manosphere and talk a little bit about that. So we'll definitely uh, plan on addressing that topic a little bit more. But thank you so much, Francisco uh, Franci, for the uh, super chat. Really appreciate the support, brother. Thank you very very much. Um. Next super chat comes in from is human milk vegan. Shout out to his human milk vegan. One of the best, <laughs> one of the best online names really appreciate. It. He says, what do you think of pop cultures transforming the term angel to mean a female romantic interest? Uh, well, it certainly is a way that devoids it of any theological context. Again, angel can be referred to something because it's so beautiful. Um, uh, I, I, I can, I, yeah, they have mixed feelings because you can talk about somebody. Somebody could be an angel in your life. Somebody could be uh, bring you closer to God, and it could be your significant other. It could be a woman. Um, at the same time, focusing too much because angel also references beauty and harmony, and, and that's why I said harmony is really the one to hit at there. Uh, we tend to use it for our significant others. I think we got to be a little bit careful, a little bit cautious, Um uh, a little bit cautious in how we kind of overly use that term in maybe a very secular way. But, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's definitely something to be concerned with. We can, we can watch out for it. The Renaissance really in the sort of Cupid, like, uh, like the, the, the infant type figure, you see orthodoxy doesn't have all these like Cupids with arrows and like babies with wings. Um, is it because there is a bit of uh, homosexual activity among some of those Renaissance painters like the Sistine Chapel? Uh, and no comment, no comment. But certainly orthodoxy doesn't have that same framework. Um, but yeah, it has become uh, often a term associated with a female romantic interest. But thank you as Human Milk Vegan for that super chat. I really appreciate it. Ryan throws in $5 and says... Uh, God bless you, TPH, and chat. Please pray for me all. Well, everybody say a prayer for Ryan. Put his name down 
on your guys' prayer list tonight if you could. Uh, I'm sure he would greatly appreciate that. Everybody, uh, keep a, keep the name Ryan in your prayers for this evening. And so uh, thank you very much, Ryan, for that super chat. I uh, really appreciate your support. Next super chat comes from Francisco Franci again. Thank you, brother, for another one. He says, two, uh, or second perspective, I just think that a lot of the be the man rhetoric does not really address the kind of completely unhinged behavior of modern women. It appears to me that many men would actually grow up by establishing families, but women don't give. Uh, so continuing into the next super chat that he sent, the time of day, even traditional women do not appreciate just an average dude who works a manual labor job and rents an apartment. It seems unless you are established, they don't, they won't notice you. But traditionally, you became established with a wife. That is true, uh, Francisco. And that would again, that that would be worth hit hitting on in a larger stream. Maybe criticizing the manosphere and talking about it in more of an orthodox context. Um, I will agree. Uh, I try to always be much harder on the men, but we, we can all agree that, that modern women are absolutely bonkers. Majority of women seem to be insane to some degree. Uh, it's like once they get over 40, especially if they've been married, they seem to be much more sane, especially if they're Christian. Uh, but the contradictions, the hypocrisy, the eagerness, this is where we have to be careful. Uh, I, I see too many women want to bash men all the time, even in our orthosphere and too many men want to bash women, even in our orthosphere. And so we just have to make sure we're not making each other scapegoats for the personal reasons why nobody wants to be with us. I think for some, for some women, they may be approaching uh, over 30. They may be overly masculine. They may be overly dominant. They may have un, um, unreasonable requests for a suitable uh, spouse. And in so doing, they just you know blame men for all the reasons why they themselves are going to be unhappy and not be with anybody. And that can also happen for men. So we have to be very careful. In regards, if you're a, if you're a young man and you're trying to do everything traditional and uh, you come across a woman that is absolutely unhinged and insane, I don't think trying to redeem or, or salvage that would necessarily be the right move. Uh, you need to pick your battles wisely. If there's a lot of good characteristics, if she's going to church, if she's trying to move in the right direction, I think surely... Uh, you can have some type of uh, lindliness, you know, uh, charitable, be a little bit forgiving. Uh, there's certain things that obviously that really are detrimental to a long term relationship. Uh, and and we're all we're all affected by modernism. So even when we want to talk about modern women, we're all modern men, whether we want to be traditional or not, we're still modern men to some degree. And so we're affected by our technologies. If, if Marshall McLuhan hasn't taught us anything, the fact that we're doing all this online, we're affected by the technologies. We're affected by all this stuff. Just as much as we want to say the women are affected by TikTok and XYZ and OnlyFans, well, men are also affected from, in one way or another. So I think the best thing we can do is to become way more self-conscious, way more self-conscious. This is true for both Orthodox women and Orthodox men. How self-conscious can you become? Can you, I think that would benefit us a lot. Does that mean you're going to be able to find a spouse as, as Francisco's highlighting? Uh, not necessarily. Um, but in the regards to be the man rhetoric, um, I, I can understand. Yeah. There's a lot of emphasis on being overly masculine or in, even talking about the manosphere. You hear this, Oh, you got to spin multiple plates. You got to have multiple girlfriends. You got to be doing, it's like, no, that's that's not what it means to be a man. Um, I think uh, for me, I would put a little bit more emphasis on your skill, your purpose, your the vehicle that you're moving through life in. It's like you're creating a vehicle. Ultimately, what you are doing as a man is you're creating a vehicle moving from where you're at, continually moving to where you want to go. And that vehicle has space for other passengers. If you're not in that vehicle moving towards your goals and towards the destinations that are going to create uh, money, uh, wealth, opportunities, 
you don't even have a place for another person to sit next to you in the passenger seat. So you're driving, you're driving the car, but you don't even have another seat for a woman to sit there and be a passenger and, and aid you in that journey. And then eventually maybe fill up those back seats with kids. So, um, I think unfortunately it is lonely out there. We can't be too focused on not having a partner or trying to get a partner. Our top priority should be as men trying to build those vehicles of commerce, of business, of skill sets that is going to allow the opportunity for somebody to come in our lives that can sit in that passenger seat and allow us to be that driver moving forward. So, um, um, I think these are certainly useful, uh, useful ways to, to try to approach these topics because it's difficult. It's very difficult. We're all affected. We're all not who we want to be. You know, we want to talk about, well, they're not traditional women. Well, okay. Can you build a house? Can you, can you work on your car? Can you, you know, are you handy around the house? Can you build things as also having a professional job or another? It's like, we're all falling short. I know. I, I, that's where I'm weak. I'm, I'm weak on working on cars. I'm weak on building, you know, I'm going to go build a, a, a small shed outside. Well, that might take me a little bit more because my skill sets in books and ideas and writing and all this intellectual stuff. So, um, I know that I'm not a full traditional man in certain ways. Um, so we just need to be self-aware and look at ourselves where we can improve but also don't budge that on that being a man thing. I, I, if I had, if I could give anybody advice, some of these young men is don't be a simp. Do not let a woman walk over you. Do not let loneliness be a reason for you to lose your own self-respect. Cause that is a recipe for disaster. That is a recipe for a terrible life and a terrible, a terrible marriage and it's just an unfulfilling existence. Don't let that be the case. So do not let a woman walk over you, whatever you do, um, Francisco. I agree that the be the man rhetoric is a little bit overblown, that there's there's real problems uh, with unhinged behavior in modern women. I agree also with some modern men. It appears to me that many men would actually grow up by establishing families but women don't. I agree that men would actually grow up if they established families, if they had kids with women that would stay there and participate. I agree with that. I think that's an insightful point. He says, even traditional women do not appreciate just an average dude who works a manual labor job and rents an apartment. It's true. It's true. And, and Francisco, again, also approached that topic from if you were a traditional woman. So say you were, you were an average, above average looking traditional woman. And say you're in your mid twenties, so you're in your mid twenties. You're fertile. You're not stabbed. You're you're a traditional woman. You want to have babies and be that homemaker for somebody. At the same time, don't you think for on their end, they're trying to make sure that they get the best opportunities they have with what their value sets are too. Now, I'm not saying again, I have no idea your content, so I'm not criticizing you at all or any because I agree with you. I'm just saying we have to look at it in two ways. Pretty hard to totally establish a family inside an apartment. I say this while I don't own my own home. So I'm with you. That would that's where I would be. Uh, I think manual labor, that one is a that one is a big one. If a woman doesn't respect a man because he does manual labor, then she's just not a good person. Because manual labor is a skill that will always put food on the table. It will always, um, it will always make money. So um, if she doesn't respect you because you do manual labor, then just kick her, just kick her to the curb. Like it's not worth your time. It's not worth your time. Um, but if it's because you know maybe you don't live in a in an you if you don't have the opportunities. If you're a traditional woman, you're trying to live this traditional lifestyle and you have, you're above average looking, you're young, you're fertile, you have the right values and maybe you're becoming orthodox. Well, to a degree for that woman, she is trying to make sure that she gets her best options. As men, we're also trying to do that. And unfortunately for us, that's why I say focus on your skill set, focus on um, your business, your money making opportunities. And unfortunately, that's what we have to do. We're, we're laity. We're, we're the part of the church that makes babies and babies aren't cheap. And so we got to make money. 
And so you have to be practical. You have to have one foot in the world and one foot in, in the kingdom. And so, you know, we can't try to expect women who are going to be more worldly by nature to want to be with a man who's got a foot and a half over in the kingdom and he's got very little to show for in the world. You can't expect a woman to do that. At the same time, you can't expect a woman to be two feet in the world and not a foot in the kingdom as well. This is a, this is a meeting. So we, as men, we need one foot in the world, making money, providing one foot in the kingdom, our theology, our, 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 our serious religious pursuits. And then we need to find a woman straddling that same divide, one foot in the kingdom. That's where you want to go. That's where we're trying to get to together. One foot, um, one foot in the world to have children, to focus on worldly things. So I, I, I know I'm ranting on this topic, but, um, Definitely, I'll do a stream in the future on it, Francisco. So thanks for bringing it up. I'll definitely write it down. I was wanting to do a stream critiquing the manosphere and some of the stuff that they talk about. Some stuff that maybe is really blunt and maybe it's useful, some not so much. Um, also, a lot of betas uh, in the manosphere. But uh, yeah, I think if uh, both men and women grow up as they have families and at the same time, you don't want to do it with the wrong person. So it's like you, you got to pray, make sure you pray and make sure you get with that right person. That's for you, that you guys are going to pursue building something in the world. If you're building a family, you're, you're building something in space and time. At the same time, the point of your relationship is to enter into the kingdom together. So that's why I, I like the, the metaphor here of like, you need, you go, you both have to have your eyes on the prize, which is eternity. But you also have to be really pragmatic and worldly. Like I need to make money. I need to get get my things, my affairs in order. I need to make sure that if I want that trad woman who's going to be at home with the kids and she's going to bake and make make things, that I make enough money that I provide that lifestyle for them. We can't be too rosy eyed in, in how we approach this stuff. So that's where if we just if become a little bit more self aware, I think everybody wins in the end. So. That's enough on that topic. Thank you much, Francisco, for the super chats and for your multiple uh, questions tonight and support. I really, really appreciate it, brother. Thank you very much. And it looks like the last super chat comes in from the uh, the glorious, my friends down in a, in in the south. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give a location, but shout out to Michael and Maria. Thank you guys so much. Threw in ten dollars here at the end of the stream and said. Thank you for all you do. Looking forward to the book club. Yes, that will be next. Uh, that'll be our last book club meeting for um, uh, for the Master Margarita. And so um, really looking forward to it as well. And she's, so they say, looking forward to the book club. Maria has been learning to write icons. Whoa, that's awesome. Please pray for her work is guided by God and directing to God. Amen to that. Looking forward to more streams. Always powerful. We greatly appreciate it. I greatly appreciate you guys, Michael and Maria, and all your support. Can't wait to dive back into the book club uh, next Tuesday. And thank you guys for all your support and everything you do. Uh, really, really appreciate it. I'll definitely say a prayer for Maria tonight and her new uh, endeavors into writing icons. So shout out to her. And I'm sure you guys are, are hopefully doing well. I'm sure that you are. And so thank you guys very, very much. I really, really appreciate all your support. God bless both of you. And so again, I just want to give a special shout out to all everybody who uh, super chatted and participated tonight. Special shout out to uh, Crispy Johnson. Sh special shout out to our favorite Crispy Johnson. Um. Truth Eli, thank you very much, brother. Really appreciate uh, your super chat. I think we have different opinions on tradition and what scripture teaches and how that can be understood. But nonetheless, thanks for being here. God bless you and your family. Uh, Truth Eli, hope you're doing well, brother. Uh, shout out to George of the Hut. Thank you for your support. Shout out to Keenan, our local in house uh, artist. Uh, helping out church of the eternal logos shout out to keenan beats make sure you uh watch his watch and listen to his stuff shout out to crispy johnson for the very generous super chat this evening throws in a hundred dollars shout out to Janny sophia thank you very much Janny sophia for your super chat and your support special shout out to our bro brother the green feathers make sure everyone subscribes to his youtube channel thank you so much 
Again, it says, my patron saint is St. Raphael, the Archangel. I love the book of Tobit. <laughs> Again, and Janie Sophia said, excellent stream as usual. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janie Sophia. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, the Green Feathers. I do also love the book of Tobit, and God bless your family. And then special shout out to Francisco, throws in three super chats. Uh, really appreciate it, brother, and thanks for the heads up on that topic. I think I'll reflect and speak on that a little bit more. Um, is human milk vegan? Special shout out to you, brother. Thank you for the $15 super chat. He said, what do you think of pop culture's transforming of the term angel to mean female romantic interest? I think it is a sort of bastardization. It's part of the feminization. It's part of the worldly obsession obsession that uh, we're all going through. So it, it's consistent, but um, that beauty thing is certainly why people say that. So let's take it back. Let's uh, let's talk about cherubim and seraphim, you know what I'm saying? So thank you very much, Is Human Milk Vegan. I really appreciate your support. Special shout-out to Ryan. Uh, and then last and, and very special shout-out to Michael Marie. I look forward to us meeting again in the book club. So thank you guys very, very much. Everybody, please smash that like. I uh, would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Again, for, for part two of this stream, it's going to be up on the website for members only. Uh, please join the website with the following link and become a website member. It is a great way to support Church of the Eternal Logos. So I'd greatly appreciate that. With all that being said, thank you guys. Uh, I hope to be back maybe Wednesday night. I have another good topic, quick stream. Maybe it'll only be an hour, hour and a half stream. Uh, I'll be writing the next few days, so that's going to be my main preoccupation. Uh, I plan to film part two tomorrow night and get that up on the website. And so I may not be back. I may be back Wednesday evening. It may not be till Friday. So we'll see. But until then.